Hi guys, Sam from Manfords Makes. How are you all? Happy Saturday. Hello to all my returners and hi to any newbies. If you are new here, I hope you decide to stay around for a while because you are welcome each and every time you come over. Um, Saturdays and Sundays is where I do a reading segment where I read you stories from this book here, which is Grimm's Complete Fairy Tales. I always give a little bit of a disclaimer before I start that these stories were written a very, very, very long time ago. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> oh, I do apologise. Um, so I am literally just reading the words off the pages, guys. Any hidden meanings, any viewpoints that are very much outdated, anything that is a little bit dark or a little bit twisted is not something that I am saying I agree with. I am literally just reading you the stories that were written so, so long ago. So without further ado, let's make a start, shall we? We are starting today on story 68 and that story is the, th the thief, the thief and his master. Try getting your tongue around that guys, just saying. Okay, the, th the thief and his master. Hans wished to send his son to learn a trade, so he went into the church and prayed to our Lord God to know which would be most advantageous for him. Then the clerk got behind the altar and said, thieving, thieving. At this, Hans goes back to his son and tells him he is to learn thieving and that the Lord God had said so. So he goes with his son to seek a man who is acquainted with thieving. They walk a long time and come into a great forest where stands a little house with an old woman in it. Hans says, do you know of a man who is acquainted with thieving? You can learn that here quite well, says the woman. My son is a master of it. So he speaks with the son and asks if he knows thieving really well. The master thief says, I will teach him well. Come back when a year is over and then if you recognise your son, I will take no payment at all for teaching him. But if you don't know him, you must give me 200 talkers. The father goes home again and the son learns witchcraft and thieving thoroughly. When the year is over, the father is full of anxiety to know how he is to recognise his son. As he is thus going about in his trouble, he meets a little dwarf who says, Man, what ails you? that you are always in such trouble. Oh, says Hans, a year ago I placed my son with a master thief who told me I was to come back when the year was over and that if I did not know my son when I saw him, I was to pay 200 talkers. But if I did know him, I was to pay nothing. And now I am afraid of not knowing him and can't tell where I am to get the money. Then the dwarf tells him to take a small basket of bread with him and to stand beneath the chimney. There on the crossbeam is a basket, out of which a little bird is peeping, and that is your son. Hans goes there and throws a little basket full of black bread in front of the basket with the bird in it, and the little bird comes out and looks up. Hello, my son, are you here? says the father, and the son is delighted to see his father, but the master thief says, the devil must have prompted you, or how could you have known your son? Father, let us go now, said the youth. Then the father and son set out homeward. On the way, a carriage comes driving by and the son says to his father, I will change myself into a large greyhound and then you can earn a great deal of money by me. Then the gentleman calls from the carriage, My man, will you sell your dog? Yes, says the father. How much do you want for it? Thirty talkers. Eh, hey, man, that is too much. But as it is such a very fine dog, I will have it. The gentleman takes it into his carriage but when they have driven a little further, the dog springs out of the carriage through the window and goes back to his father and is no longer a greyhound. They go home together. Next day, there is a fair in the neighbouring town, so the youth says to his father, I will now change myself into a beautiful horse and you can sell me, but when you have sold me, you must take off my bridle or I cannot become a man again. Then the father goes with the horse to the fair <clears throat> and the master thief comes and buys the horse for a hundred talkers but the father forgets and does not take off the bridle. So the man goes home with the horse and puts it in the stable. When the maid crosses the threshold, the horse says, take off my bridle, take off my bridle. Then the, man stand, then the maid stands still 
and says, what can you, what can you speak? So she goes and takes the bridle off and the horse becomes a sparrow and flies out at the door and the master becomes a sparrow also and flies after him. Then they come together and cast lots, but the master loses and changes himself to the water and is a fish. Then the youth also becomes a fish and they cast lots again and the master loses. So the master changes himself into a cock and the youth becomes a fox and bites the master's head off and he died and has remained dead to this day. Another strange story. Okay, so this next story is story 69 and it is called Jorinda and Joringal. There was once an old castle in the middle of a large and thick forest and in it an old woman who was a witch who dwelt all alone. In the daytime she changed herself into a cat or a screech owl but in the evening she took her proper shape again as a human being. She could lure wild beasts and birds to her and then she killed and boiled and roasted them. If anyone came within 100 paces of the castle, he was obliged to stand still and could not stir from the place until she bade him be free. But whenever an innocent maiden came within this circle, she changed her into a bird and shut her up in a wickerwork cage and carried the cage into a room in the castle. She had about 7,000 cages of rare birds in the castle. Now, there was once a maiden who was called Jorinda, who was fairer than all other girls. She and a handsome youth named Joringle had promised to marry each other. They were still in the days of betrothal and their greatest happiness was being together. One day, in order that they might be able to talk together in quiet, they went for a walk in the forest. Take care, said Joringle, that you do not go too near the castle. It was a beautiful evening. The sun shone brightly between the trunks of the trees into the dark green of the forest and the turtle dove sang mournfully upon the young boughs of the birch trees. Jorinda wept now and then. She sat down in the sunshine and was sorrowful. Joringle was sorrowful too. They were as sad as if they were about to die. Then they looked around them and were quite at a loss for they did not know by which way they should go home. The sun was still half above the mountain and half set. Joringle looked through the bushes and saw the old walls of the castle close at hand. He was horror stricken and filled with deadly fear. Jorinda was singing. My little bird with the necklace red sings sorrow, sorrow, sorrow. He sings that the dove must soon be dead. Sings sorrow, sore jug, jug, jug. Joringle looked for Jorinda. She was changed into a nightingale and sang jug, jug, jug. A screech owl with glowing eyes flew three times around about her and three times cried, To woo, to woo, to woo. Joringle could not move. He stood there like a stone and could neither weep nor speak nor move hand or foot. The sun had now set. The owl flew into the thicket and directly afterwards there came out of it a crooked old woman, yellow and lean, with large red eyes and a hook nose, the point of which reached to her chin. She muttered to herself, caught the nightingale and took it away in her hand. Joringle could neither speak nor move from the spot. The nightingale was gone. At last the woman came back and said in a hollow voice, Greetings, Zachiel. If the moon shines on the cage, Zachiel let him loose at once. Then Joringle was freed. He fell on his knees before the woman and begged that she would give him back his Jorinda, but she said that he should never have her again and went away. He called, he wept, he lamented, but all in vain. Oh, what is to become of me? Joringle went away and at last came to a strange village. There he kept sheep for a long time. He often walked round and round the castle, but not too near it. At last he dreamt one night that he found a blood-red flower in the middle of which was a beautiful large pearl, that he picked the flower and went, into the, and went with it to the castle, and that everything he touched with the flower was freed from enchantment. He also dreamt that by means of it he recovered his Jorinda. In the morning, when he awoke, he began to seek over hill and dale if he could find such a flower. He sought until the ninth day, and then early in the morning he found the blood-red flower. In the middle of it there was a large dewdrop, as big as the finest pearl. Day and night he journeyed with this flower to the castle. When he was within a hundred paces of it, he was not held fast and walked on to the door. Joringle was full of joy. He touched the door with the flower and it sprang open. He walked in through the courtyard and listened for the sound of the birds. At last he heard it. He went on and found the room from which it came, and there the witch was feeding the birds in the seven thousand cages. 
When she saw Joringle, she was angry, very angry, and scolded and spat poison and gall at him, but she could not come within two paces of him. He did not take any notice of her, but went and looked at the cages with the birds, but there were many hundred nightingales. How was he to find his Jorinda again? <clears throat> Just then he saw the old woman quietly take away a cage with a bird in it and go towards the door. Swiftly he sprang towards her, touched the cage with the flower and also the old woman. She could now no longer bewitch anyone and Jorinda was standing there clasping him around the neck and she was as beautiful as ever. Okay, and we will read just one more today, and it is story 70, which is The Three Sons of Fortune. A father once called his three sons before him, and he gave to the first a cock, to the second a scythe, and to the third a cat. I am already aged, said he. My death is near, and I have wished to take thought for you before my end. Money I have not, and what I now give you seems of little worth but all depends on your making a sensible use of it. Seek out a country where such things are still unknown and your fortune is made. After the father's death, the eldest went away with his cock, but wherever he came, the cock was already known. In every town he saw from a long distance a cock sitting upon the steeples and turning round with the wind, and in the villages he heard more than one crowing. No one would show any wonder at the creature, so that it did not look as if he would make his fortune by it. At last, however, it happened that he came to an island where the people knew nothing about cocks and did not even understand how to divide their time. They certainly knew when it was morning or evening, but at night, if they did not sleep through it, not one of them knew how to find out the time. Look, said he, what a proud creature. It has a ruby red crown upon its head and wears spurs like a knight. It calls you three times during the night at fixed hours, and when it calls for the last time, the sun soon rises. But if it crows by broad daylight, then take notice, for there will certainly be a change of weather. The people were well pleased. For a whole night they did not sleep and listened with great delight as the cock at two, four and six o'clock loudly and clearly proclaimed the time. They asked if the creature were for sale and how much he wanted for it. About as much gold as an ass can carry, answered he. A ridiculously small price for such a precious creature, they cried unanimously, and willingly gave him what he had asked. When he came home with his wealth, his brothers were astonished, and the second said, Well, I will go forth and see whether I cannot get rid of my ciphers profitably. But it did not look good, as if he would, for labourers met him everywhere, and they had scythes upon their shoulders as well as he. At last, however, he chanced upon an island, where the people knew nothing of scythes, when the corn was ripe there, they took cannon out to the fields and shot it down. Now this was rather an uncertain affair. Many shot right over it, others hit the ears instead of the stems and shot them away, whereby much was lost, and besides all this, it made a terrible noise. So the man set to work and mowed it down so quietly and quickly that the people opened their mouths with astonishment. They agreed to give him what he wanted for the scythe, and he received a horse laden with as much gold as it could carry. And now the third brother wanted to take his cat to the right man. He fared just like the others. So long as he stayed on the mainland, there was nothing to be done. Every place had cats, and there were so many of them that newborn kittens were generally drowned in the ponds. At last he sailed over to an island, and it luckily happened that no cats had ever yet been seen there, and that the mice had got the upper hand so much that they danced upon the tables and benches whether the master were at home or not. The people complained bitterly of the plague. The king himself in his palace did not know how to secure himself against them. Mice squeaked in every corner and gnawed whatever they could lay hold of with their teeth. But now the cat began her chase and soon cleared a couple of rooms and the people begged the king to buy the wonderful beast for the country. The king willingly gave what was asked, which was a mule laden with gold and jewels and the third brother came home with the greatest treasure of all. The cat made herself merry with the mice in the royal palace and killed so many that they could not be counted. At last she grew warm with the work and thirsty, so she stood still, lifted up her head and cried, Mew! Mew! When they heard this strange cry, the king and all his people were frightened and in their terror ran all at once out of the palace. Then the king took counsel what was best to be done. At last it was determined to send a herald to the cat and demand that she should leave the palace, or if not, she was to expect 
that force would be used against her. The councillors said, we would rather let ourselves be plagued with the mice, for to that misfortune we are accustomed than give up our lives to such a monster as this. A noble youth, therefore, was sent to ask the cat whether she would peaceably quit the castle, but the cat, whose thirst had become still greater, merely answered, Mew, Mew. The youth understood her to say, Most certainly not, most certainly not, and took this answer to the king. Then, said the councillors, she shall yield to force. Cannon were brought out, and the palace was soon in flames. When the fire reached the room where the cat was sitting, she sprang safely out of the window, but the besiegers did not leave off until the whole palace was shot down to the ground. And that is where the story ends, guys. So that was three stories today and I am going to leave it there if that is okay with you. I am actually filming this on Thursday the 18th of August and I believe that Mike is cooking my dinner and it is almost ready. So I hope you enjoyed those three stories for today. There will of course be some more stories tomorrow. Um... And then another week over at Manfa's to look forward to. So until then, guys, stay safe, be kind, look after one another, get some good quality time in with your loved ones and get some good quality crafting time in. And I will see you in the next one or around YouTube streets. Bye, guys. Love you.